Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, today, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome back Dr. Eric Zacharias. Uh, Dr. Zacharias is a board certified internist and he is a physician risk manager and uh, clinical educator for Copic. Um, he provided us with a great Grand Rounds on uh, opioid prescribing back in May and he has very kindly uh, accepted our invitation uh, to present again today, the title of his talk is If I Told You Once, I Told You a Thousand Times, Recurring Issues That Get You Sued. Uh, and uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Zacharias. Thank you. Thank you for having me back. I really appreciate it. And, you know, this the, the title of this, uh, about two years ago, we were trying to give our uh, our presentations a little more of a catchy title so i'm not here to be a scold for the next 45 minutes it just seemed like a catchy way to say gosh everybody uh you know i've been doing risk management for 25 years and uh about 15 with copic and it seems the same things keep happening again and again uh irrespective of the setting and so we thought it would be a a good idea to put in our uh, our arsenal of talks, something that says, gosh, here's the things that just keep on happening uh, year in, year out. And uh, so the anyway, we gave it the, what may, may or may not be viewed as a, as a catchy title. Um, so disclosure standpoint, uh, no conflicts of interest, no financial interest with anything I'm going to describe. And I used a disclaimer that I used probably in the opioid talk uh, that, that I'd love to say, which is I still like medicine, still like being a doc. Medicine's great. Uh, learning objectives with our active CME verbs, uh, describing areas that are higher risk for patient safety and how to reduce that risk. Articulate when you're in a situation that warrants heightened vigilance and describe what you can uh, do to improve uh, patient safety. Uh, here's the uh, the ultra challenging pretest pro post test, which uh, you may be able to get these right pretest. Um, but uh, true or false, uh, how you communicate with patients and your staff can affect the likelihood of lawsuits. Uh, you may need a while to contemplate that. Uh, it, the answer is true, and we'll go through a few scenarios. Uh, communication has a huge impact on uh, physician-patient relationships, likelihood of lawsuits. And uh, if you live in the real world, it probably uh, uh, affects the rest of your relationships as well. So, yeah, communication critically important. Um, and then the second, the true or false lawsuits rarely involve common medical conditions. And uh, that is, of course, false. What we typically see is common severe conditions come in early in the course of their presentation, uh, i.e. the acute MI when someone has some mild indigestion as opposed to someone walking in with an elephant sitting on their chest. Uh, same condition, uh, different course. Uh, of action uh, based on the symptoms it can result in a lawsuit both can be competent care so i'm going to start with um with board complaints uh, this is an area that comes up again and again uh, in colorado uh, and i'm sure the rest of of uh, states as well doctors will say gosh you know what do i what do i do if uh, if a patient reports reports me to the board and, and you know, the medical boards serve as a liaison between uh, essentially society and our government regulators and active practitioners. The board really uh, is there uh, to do a good job. They are tasked under law to investigate complaints. They're a pain in the neck uh, to get a board complaint uh, with or without merit. Uh, the good news is if you're Copic insured, your Copic policy uh, covers assistance with a board complaint. Uh, so the first thing you do if there's a board complaint is, is give us a call and uh, we can take this off your plate and get somebody to assist you. The, the recurrent thing that we see really are two things. One is uh, physicians will get apoplectic when they get the board complaint and they will call or engage or, or in some other way uh, interact with the patient when they're not at their best. Uh, nine times out of 10, this is either recorded or gets sent to the board and says, you know, Dr. Zacharias, when I complained, uh, was completely unhinged and called and yelled at me. 
And then you're stuck with a second board complaint and you may or may not get referred for uh, you know, mental health assessment. Like, do you really have an anger management disorder? And the answer is no. I just, when people complain to the board about me, I lose it. Um, yeah, which means you're a human, but you can't express that to your patients. And so that's what we see. I had a, a case actually in my own office where one of uh, one of my internal medicine uh, partners had just a, just an off the charts annoying patient. Uh, I won't go into all of the details, but essentially it was a they got into a, a what turned out to be a real argument about whether or not this person needed an emotional support dog um, uh, form signed on an emergency basis. And uh, it just escalated and didn't go well. And then there was a board complaint. And then my uh, partner uh, called up this uh, this patient and uh, was, uh, again, not at her finest moment. This was, of course, recorded and sent to the board. And she got six weeks of, you know, anger management. She's the world's nicest person, too, by the way. But she got like six six weeks of anger management um, uh, assigned. There. It went on her license. And so it's a real it's a real hassle factor. So. You know, again, I, I get the frustration, um, but, you, you know, take a trusted colleague, go into a closed room, you know, go ahead and let your emotions out. But when you're around your staff, around the patients, especially anything uh, communicating directly to the patient and writing emails and so on, just don't don't do it. Don't editorialize. It will come back to bite you. Number one. Number two is even if you're you know very calm and, and uh, I'm sure everybody here is much more reasonable and, and has better control of their faculties than I do. Um, but even if you are very calm, responding to this, do you really want to have a, a weekend where you spend your time drafting a response to a board complaint as opposed to having an attorney who your policy covers, which is paid for, uh, draft one on your behalf, which then you can uh, survey, uh, make sure it hits all the uh, the appropriate board um, board issues to, to resolve. So that's what we recommend. We just, we see this every month, uh, doctors dig themselves into holes. So just if hopefully you won't get board complaints, but if you do, uh, let us know, we can assist you. Uh, there's some areas you're very, very good at and, uh, responding to these as at least historically is not physicians, uh, strong suit. Um, another area, uh, recurrent area is, is curbsides. And, you know, the, the, the curbside, really, the question is, are you establishing a physician-patient relationship or not with a curbside? And the answer is no. Um, but the question is, is, is the conversation an actual consult or, or a curbside? And, you know, we see this more commonly in the hospital um, and in the, uh, in the ER, it happens a little bit in clinics, but it's usually in the hospital, in the ER. And I'll give you a scenario, and this just comes down to, again, kind of the communication, just very clear lines. And I guess I'll give the answer before I give the case, is if you need a consult, make it clear that you're asking for a consult. If it's a curbside discussion, make sure it's clear that it's just a, a curbside question. You're essentially using a professional colleague uh, as, as an up-to-date resource. Uh, rather than going on the computer, you happen to see the ID doc walking by and you say, hey, what's the starting dose of gym? And uh, we have a case in the, uh, it was in the ICU, uh, an ID doc was walking out, a physician was walking in and, and literally said, hey, what's the, what's the starting dose of gym? And uh, I don't even know the dose, three mix per kg, Q8. I, I made that up, don't use that for your patients, but it's somewhere in that ballpark probably. And uh, anyway, so the, the doc walked in and started the gent and said, starting gent for septic patient, you know, Mr. Jones at three mix per kg Q8 per infectious disease discussion. And it turned out that this patient, you know, was 87, had a creatinine of, I think it was like two six. And uh, anyway, but with that gent dose, they got renal damage, got eighth cranial nerve uh, damage. And uh, they, uh, the, the, a patient in the family sued the doctor and in the course of discovery they saw the id note in there and and they actually brought the infectious disease doc in and sued the id doc um who of course had no idea what on earth uh, they were talking about but because the chart said uh you know discussion with id starting gent for their recommendations uh it was interpreted as a consult 
uh, I mean, ultimately, we were able to get that doctor out of the lawsuit. But I promise you uh, that ID doc did not send Christmas cards to that hospital anymore. Uh, you know, it's, it's very frustrating to get trapped, uh, you know, being basically assigned a consult. You don't actually have one. So it just needs to be clear communication. If you're going to have a discussion, which is a curbside and uh, the documentation of it, is not going to further the care and treatment of the patient and is not necessary for the next person, then I would just ask you to say, do I need to document this? What is the upside of saying I talked to ID? Or put another way is, if you can't stand not putting I talked to ID in the chart, you probably need to ask for an ID consult. Uh, so just be clear in that communication uh, with your with your specialists. Uh, it'll go a long way, yeah, keep you on a lot more Christmas card lists. Maybe you'll get invited to some holiday parties and so on. Um, some of the areas that we really recommend, you know, if you do need a curbside consult, uh, you know, for example, the ICU patient, the immediate post-op patient, or the uh, a, a patient in active labor, uh, almost all situations that are that potentially fraught uh, with risk, uh, getting a uh, getting a formal consult. If there's any cardiologists on here, I'm sure you've, you know, had a, a million and one times in passing where somebody asks you, hey, is this, uh, is this EKG okay? You know, what, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, is it a consult? Is it not a consult? Are they going to write down, discuss with cardiology? So again, just the clear communication of, are you asking me to read the EKG? Or are you going to make a determination? Um, you know, the language curbside means did not ask for nor give a formal consult. Uh, the uh, curbside E uh, did not uh, interview the patient, didn't formally review the record, and didn't bill for it. So, by the way, if if the infectious disease doc in that scenario had billed for that, that's no longer a curbside. Um, so, if you're going to be billing for uh, care and treatment, you now have a, a physician-patient relationship. So, just uh, keep that in mind and well. Again, happens again and again. Uh, so, negligence. Uh, what is the definition of negligence? Negligence is failure to meet the standard of care. And what's the definition of standard of care? You know, it's what a reasonable and prudent physician in same or similar, same or similar circumstances with uh, uh, same, or, same or similar training would be expected to do or what would, a, what would appear to. So it's the, the range of acceptable practices. So in a lawsuit, uh, you have to have a physician-patient relationship. You have to. There has to be negligence, which is uh, practicing uh, below the standard of care. Um, one of the things that's so powerful uh, in protecting you when uh, there's high-risk situations or scenarios that can result in complications or adverse events with, you know, in the absence of negligence, which happens quite often actually, uh, is an informed consent discussion. Um, and so the reason I throw this negligence slide up here, um, you know, I don't know who does barbecues like that, but uh, it's high, not recommended, high risk, um, but is, a, is an informed consent discussion, a, a, a shared decision-making discussion uh, can take this scenario, you know, in the patient's mind, it looks like you're an idiot throwing gas uh, here, uh, as opposed to a shared decision-making process. So what are some situations I'm talking about? For instance, starting a high-risk medication. So if you're going to start, uh, say, Lamotrigine or Lamictal is the brand, you know, right? so, or, or really any of the uh, seizure medications, they have a high risk for Stephen Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis. Uh, th those have, you know, I think it's like 5 to 20% fatality. We see Stephen Johnson's cases every week, even though it's a very rare, not every week, every month, even though it's a very rare condition, they almost always wind up in lawsuits uh, because an informed consent discussion uh, did not occur. Whereas I don't think I've ever seen uh, uh, a Stephen Johnson or toxic epidermal uh, necrolysis case when an informed decision has been done. The other thing for those of you who are prescribers, where do we see it? Uh, uh, allegations of, of negligence and the absence of negligence is as prednisone, so long-term steroids. Uh, we see it with uh, with anticoagulants. Um, you know, if you're going to have somebody on long-term anticoagulation, it's really good to have the informed consent discussion. Uh, you know, chronic opioids uh, and 
Uh, anybody who does procedures, uh, again, you know, if, if you don't want to have a complication from procedures, don't do procedures. It will happen occasionally, but you can have a complication in the absence of negligence and participating in that informed consent. If the patient feels like they're heard and listened, uh, listened to uh, pre-procedure, then it dramatically uh, reduces the likelihood of a lawsuit. It doesn't always protect you, uh, but it certainly reduces the likelihood. And the other thing is also uh, is, is disclosure. So when there is an adverse event, uh, timely disclosure really helps reduce the likelihood of a lawsuit. Uh, patients feel heard, they feel cared for, and uh, yeah, most people are fairly sympathetic uh, to a practitioner who's communicating uh, communicating well with them. So uh, heightened vigilance. This is my you know <laughs> when when to pay attention. This is this is driving in in 2021. Oh, actually, this is probably driving about five years. I think that's a I don't even know what kind of a phone that is, but uh, nonetheless, that's what people do now when they when they drive. They don't pay attention. Uh, and, and high-risk scenarios such as driving. But these scenarios I'm going to go through uh, are where about uh, 70% of our claims occur, uh, especially in cognitive fields. Uh, but these same diagnoses also occur in procedure-oriented fields. Procedure-oriented fields, though, again, the informed consent shared decision is huge. It's not just a, a touchy-feely word. It actually really... Uh, uh, really makes a difference in the in the likelihood of losses. It is you know it's better care. Um, but anyway, so back to the the high risk scenarios. We use this heads, hearts, bugs, bellies um, description, and I give this presentation to uh, to medical residents all the time. And uh, you know I'll, I'll ask them questions just to kind of help them pay attention. Unfortunately, I can't see you all, so I I won't be able to say, hey, what are the things that can cause neurosymptoms, which can go from subtle to catastrophic very quickly. And, you know, some of the things are encephalitis, meningitis, uh, strokes, uh, those are the most common, um, you know, space occupying spinal cord lesions. And the reasons why these result in lawsuits are they're sometimes very difficult to diagnose. And uh, when they present early in the course, uh, I don't know who here has seen posterior circulation strokes or even hopefully some of you especially if there are any neurologists on here, um, you know, understand posterior circulation exams and findings, but they can present very subtly. So the posterior circulation, you know, it's mostly cerebellar, so that's coordination uh, findings. So people do, you know, someone comes in with neuro findings, and if they have a droopy face or an arm that doesn't work, like it's a stroke. But if they're dizzy, you think, oh, one more dizzy patient, but that's how posterior circulation strokes uh, present. And so just knowing uh, what are the risk areas, uh, you know, who on the screen loves when a patient comes in and says, yeah, I'm really dizzy. Uh, it's a tough workup. It's a tough differential. It's really hard uh, to sort out the, uh, the possibilities. Uh, you don't even have to necessarily find the posterior circulation stroke. If you don't look for it, or if you don't consider it, if you don't do the cerebellar exam, it's very hard uh, to defend. And the same with the space occupying spinal cord lesions. Again, it's very rare unless you work at Copic and we see that monthly. And it's uh, anybody who has neck pain, back pain, fever, and neurologic symptoms has a space occupying spinal cord lesion until proven otherwise. Um, and this is a scenario when your doctor number, you know, whoever on day five and the person can't move their legs or has, has saddle anesthesia, it's very easy to pick up. But when you're the, the doc in the clinic and it's you know, patient number 27 on a 35 patient day, and it's somebody with a little back pain and their temperatures, you know, 99.5, uh, it's very easy to, to send them out. So just, you know, just know those, uh, those areas of, of high risk uh, neurologically. My brother's, a, my brother's a neurologist, and by the way, even he doesn't do a full neuro exam, right? It's, it, it takes forever. But he does a focused and targeted exam when appropriate, and so when someone has these findings, again, especially dizziness, you got to do that posterior uh, circulation exam. He probably does do a full neuro exam, by the way. Um, anyway, so chest, so chest pain, um, you know, what gets you sued? What do you miss in the chest? Well, it's the classic triple rule out, right? So 
it's the, the three things will make you fall over dead that cause chest pain, or at least that's what we you know teach the med students, right? So it's acute coronary syndrome, you know, especially with an arrhythmia. Uh, it's a pulmonary emboles and it's dissection. Um, and if somebody has chest pain and they come to see me in the clinic, uh, you know, I'm not necessarily going to cath everybody or CT uh, angiogram everybody, uh, but I at least need to consider those possibilities and and know that you know we had a case where a doc ordered a an outpatient troponin on a Friday afternoon and didn't look at it again until Monday. Uh, probably not his finest moment. I mean, who here thinks waiting to look at a troponin level for three days? Uh, is is best care if you're looking for a coronary syndrome. And uh, it was a very good doc, too. They just kind of were thinking, well, it could be the chest. Let's just let's check a troponin and a D-dimer. I'll check it. I'll see what they look like on Monday. We'll fall. You know, so remember, these are the things that will make somebody fall over dead. And if you're seriously uh, concerned about uh, somebody's symptoms, uh, you know, just just think about what the appropriate urgency of the uh, of the evaluation. My uh, my son's actually taking uh, taking ACLS right now. He's uh, certifying in that, and we were going over the chest pain differential, or we were going over all the different ways that an MI can present. And I was, you know, starting to break out into a cold sweat, realizing that basically almost any symptom above the navel uh, can be a uh, can be coronary syndrome. So. Uh, it it good doctors can miss this, but certainly if someone has has chest pain and, and you want to work it up, A, it's not a way to check the labs on three days, and B, have a low threshold um, for referral to emergency department or, or consultation if you need further evaluation. Imaging and labs, of course, can be can be very valuable, right? Cardiologists don't miss MIs. You know why? Because they get a cath, everybody. Uh, internists miss MIs. Uh, ER docs miss MIs because, you know, they don't they're earlier in this in the progression of the symptoms and and the workup. So uh, also cut your cut your professional colleagues a little slack um, because the size of the, of the patient volume you see and the acuity that you're able to work up has a significant impact on the risk. Um, but yeah, chest pain is important. Abdominal pain. Hopefully, some of you have seen the movie uh, Alien. Great movie if you haven't seen it. Um, but anyway, so abdominal pain is, uh, there's two things with abdominal pain. Uh, you know, one is we see lawsuits where either uh, vital signs are not done or vital signs are significantly abnormal and not worked up further. Uh, the other thing that can be really valuable, and one of the, the magic powers with being in a clinic on a daily basis uh, is is seeing a patient back for a recheck, a reexamination, or keeping somebody around for a few hours and evaluating them. Of course, the CTs helped us a lot. Um, the things we see missed in the belly, you know, as you would assume, you know, an appy, uh, but more commonly, it's the more subtle things like ischemic bowel uh, that come and go, a perforated uh, diverticulum, and uh, anybody post-op uh, is really important. So if you're uh, you know, if you're a surgeon, you need to get the post-op abdominal pain pretty straightforward. If you're the internist or the ER doc, and we really recommend if somebody's in a post-op state, is get the, uh, ideally the operating surgeon uh, or whoever's on call, but ideally the operating surgeon involved as quickly as possible because uh, that is, uh, boy, we see a lot of catastrophes with that. And one of my missions in life is to stamp out uh, people who mi or stamp out the missing of this condition because this is you know, probably every two months. So the classic scenario, uh, uh, an 11-year-old boy brought in by his mother, complains of my belly is really hurting, my stomach's killing me. Uh, you walk in the room uh, to see this young boy and his pain's completely gone. He's like, mom, I, I, I don't hurt anymore. I want to go home. And, and so you send them home because they're all better. Don't do that. Okay, ten times out of ten, this boy has torsion, and a young boy would rather die of a torsed testicle and then drop his pants uh, in a in a doctor's office setting. So just again, kind of know your patient population. Um, the human pelvis is 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 part of the human body. Um, you know, no one likes making a young person drop their drawers. 
but uh, young boys with belly pain, uh, they have torsion until until proven otherwise, and that is a very common miss. Very easy to miss too. It's not it not bad docs. You just have to know this is a high risk scenario where we see a lot of lawsuits. What else do we see? Uh, neck fash, uh, miss necrotizing fasciitis. And if anybody's ever seen neck fash, and I've had a few cases, um, if you see it really early on. And it's kind of like somebody with mild indigestion who's having a big stimmy uh, before the elephant's on the chest. Uh, early early um, neck fash, uh, the classic findings are often there in retrospect, pain out of proportion, abnormal vital signs, fever, elevated heart rate. Uh, the two times I had really early neck fashion patients, one had Ebola um, on, their, uh, on their hand and their hand was very, very sore. And the only reason I diagnosed that one correctly was because I had missed it in somebody a few years earlier where he had the same thing on his knee and a really, really sore knee. Uh, thank God this guy came back a couple hours later when his knee was really red and swollen and we you know, got him uh, got him taken care of. And by the way, uh, again, for my surgical colleagues out there, this one's on you. Uh, the, tr the only treatment that's shown to increase survival for neck fash is, is emergency surgery. Um, so if you're worried about the possibility of neck fash, uh, this is not order some outpatient labs and check them back the next day. This is a medical emergency. Get them to the hospital, get the surgery team notified <clears throat> right away. The other things we see are missed septic joints, um, you know, missed endocarditis. Uh, that's, that's a big one. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, I already mentioned the spinal space, like behind spinal, uh, epidural abscesses or spinal cord lesions. That's, that's huge. So I got vital signs on here. I don't know if y'all can see. If anybody's been to Hawaii, this place has great shaved ice in Hawaii. I'm told my wife is just there were some friends, and I got this coffee mug. Um, it's a good coffee mug. So vital signs we see several things. One is not done. Uh, up to 40% when we do practice quality reviews, up to 40% of office visits for acute complaints. This is not just the routine follow-up, um, you know, on, on like the SSR or whatever. And you should still do them, by the way. But acute visits, bottle signs are not done. And, and we tried to have a discussion with a one urgent care doc who said, well, I don't do them unless the patient's really sick. I'm like, well, you know, I have <laughs> Uh, so what tough, tough conversation, but, um, very healthy people can look pretty good and not catastrophically sick when something bad's going on. And it can be important early warning signs. Um, so failing to do vital signs dramatically increases your risk of missing, uh, something. So again, the classic, the high, low pulse, well, you guys know what vital signs are. Um, and if they're abnormal vital signs, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to admit them. You just have to have more, you know, explain why in this 38 year old with a skinned knee and a pulse of 120 and a blood pressure of 90, why are you not doing a further evaluation? Maybe there's a rational reason, um, but you need to uh, just explain. We can, ex we can defend a good thought process, but failing to uh, look at or discuss an abnormal finding in the face of a symptom can be very difficult uh, to defend. Um, so again, what do you avoid? Not doing them. This is what I'm, this is a real uh, this is a real screenshot. Um, this is a uh, this is an ER, and I don't know if you guys can see my screen that's blocked, but on the far right of this, as you look at it, is the respiratory rate. And if you look at the respiratory rates, there's an amazing uh, miracle uh, going on where every single one of these uh, 20, you know, plus minus 20 patients are breathing at exactly the same rate. So um, you could believe that that's what's occurring, or if you have any experience in practice, you actually know what's going on uh, with this very, very busy ER staff. And, and so, you know, respiratory rates can be very, very valuable. I mean, vital signs are important. This is a good example of, you know, of standardized, um, I'm sorry, of normalized deviation where somebody somewhere said it's okay 
or set a climate where it was okay not to actually do a respiratory rate or appropriate vital signs. Uh, you might get away with it uh, sometimes, but eventually you're going to miss you know, somebody who's who's got, uh, say, early sepsis and a high respiratory rate or uh, some other condition where they're uh, having a respiratory abnormality. So very important stuff. Uh, do the actual vital signs. This is a case, um, you know, this is the classic Occam's razor. Uh, so this was a, this was a, a trail runner. A uh, woman was running, uh, tripped, got some pain in her leg, went to the ER. Here were the vital signs. Remember, vital signs, look at those things, not good. Elevated temperature, elevated pulse. Here's the white count, looking really bad. And again, this was a good doc who missed this, uh, just not having their best day. Uh, busy, so diagnosis, runner who tripped with a calf strain and an acute viral syndrome. Well, okay, sure. Could have been that. Uh, sent home with a lot of pain, still had normal vital signs. And uh, anyway, this person wound up having, as you might guess, uh, back to our friend, uh, neck fash. So that knee goes to that very, very quickly. Uh, again, so just keeping that in mind. Um, this is the, the, the recheck that I mentioned earlier. If you're in a clinic, if you're concerned about a patient, if they've got abdominal symptoms, if you don't know what's going on and the evaluation uh, to your mind is reasonable and appropriate, check back in on them. Um, you know, I, I, I'm in a fee for service setting. I see patients for money. So a, I get paid to do it. Be shocking. The patients love the follow up. I used to not do a lot of follow up visits because I felt like I was kind of, um, I don't know what the right term is. It just felt like I was trying to give the impression that I'm trying to make money off patients, which is, of course, not why you see somebody back, but it might give that impression. Um, with telehealth, that's a real, um, real bonus in our practice. If anything decent came out of this pandemic, uh, the use of telehealth is probably one of the, the things that's a, that's a bonus. I would still rather not have had the pandemic. Um, but, uh, but telehealth can be a great way to recheck on your abdominal pain patient, your indigestion patient or whatever, just see how they're doing. And if they're not doing a lot better, because they're going to be doing one of three things, right? Better, worse, or the same. And if they're worse or the same, uh, low threshold uh, for further evaluation. So the other thing is missed malignancies. Well, we typically see, well, two things. One is failure to work up symptomatic findings. That's less common now. People have kind of got the memo that a woman who has a breast lump, where you don't find it on exam, you're not done with the evaluation, right? Or somebody who has rectal bleeding uh, and has hemorrhoids on exam. Uh, well, 50% of the population has hemorrhoids on exam. You haven't exactly uh, proven nothing else is present. So, again, low threshold for workup of, of symptomatic findings. But what, what we really see is... Uh, is systems failure. So the classic is, you know, somebody goes to uh, to the ER and they've got chest pain, doing a cardiac workup, they get a CT, because um, say the D-dimer was up by one-tenth of a point or something, and the CTA is fine, but there's a small uh, eight-millimeter nodule, you know, recommend for the repeat study in six months, so that gets called after the patient goes to the hospitalist. So the ER doc assumes the hospitalist is going to look at it. The hospitalist doesn't see it because they already got told the CTA didn't show a PE. You know, the cardiologist works with the patient and, and doesn't look at that. And then they get discharged and they follow up in the primary care doc's office who gets, you know, 745 pages from the, from the epic dump. And uh, the doesn't see that in the CT finding. And then uh, a year and a half later, the patient presents with hemoptysis. I mean, real case, Ed, we see this all the time. So get, guess who gets sued in that scenario? Or let me put it another way. If you were that patient and you came in and you had a highly resectable lesion scene and then you wound up dying of, uh, or at least having what's going to be a lethal condition, would you be frustrated? Um, and who would you sue? And the answer is, of course, everybody. So in that particular case, the ER doc got sued, the cardiologist got sued, the hospitalist got sued, and the primary care doc got sued. Um, and I don't think the radiologist, I can't remember if the radiologist got sued or not. 
Um, Cause I think the radiologist actually called the report uh, to the ER and you know, a staff member took the note. But anyway, so just incidental findings. If you are aware, if you have direct firsthand knowledge of a major un- unanticipated, unexpected finding, um, you know, directly communicate it to the patient. Uh, don't assume the next person in the chain of care is going to see it or take care of it. Even if you feel as if they should or your time with the care is done, please, 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 if you have direct knowledge of a highly suspicious finding, uh, tell the patient, document it, pick up the phone, go old school, um, and make sure you've had that closed loop uh, communication. That will go a long, long way uh, to reducing lawsuits. I'm going to talk for just a couple more minutes and then uh, turn it over to questions and then um, I can keep going on material and cases if y'all want, but I want to make sure uh, that if any que- if any questions have, uh, have popped into anybody's mind, you have time to ask them. Uh, the question of documentation comes up a lot. Uh, I can tell you that my notes are very, very sparse. I'm not a big believer in writing Harrison's textbook of medicine for every person, even though I'm an internist. Um, every person that has uh, a symptom I uh, have very, very brief notes explaining, here's my thought process, here's what I'm doing. And, and so if somebody takes over the care and treatment of my patient, they know what's going on. Uh, what we tend to see, we don't see lawsuits for sparse documentation if it's, if it's complete relative to the scenario. What we see is if you don't document your exam, if you don't, again, like think of that posterior circulation, you, you don't do it or you don't document it or you don't have return precautions uh, documented. Um, But what we really see uh, with documentation that results in lawsuits is something bad happens, then you go back and alter the record. And when I say alter the record, I don't mean you go back and lie. Uh, You go back and you say, well, I actually did this or thought about this, and then you add it later to the note. I can just tell you that's a catastrophe. So the first thing I always tell people is if there's a major unanticipated outcome, get the chart locked, don't add anything further, talk to us first, uh, it never goes well. So just let me let me walk you back from that common practice because it just looks terrible uh, when you're on the, uh, on the witness stand when the plaintiff attorney says, well, Dr. Zacharias, you became aware that your patient had this posterior circulation stroke and I noticed that you added quite a bit of findings about the posterior circulation exam. So why would you lie like that? Well, I didn't. I, I did the exam and I added it later. It was important. I just didn't put it in because it's not part of my usual note. So do you expect the jury to believe? So you just you look terrible. You, you, you can't win that. Uh, back to the communication thing, um, just how you talk to your staff, how you talk to your patients, how you interact with your professional colleagues has a huge impact on the likelihood of, of lawsuits. And uh, I don't have time to go into uh, coaching how to change your personality. I would just say we all get stressed from time to time. We all have less than optimal moments, but the more you can have positive conversations, uh, open, open into questions with your staff, be nice to your colleagues, uh, the, the less likely you are uh, to wind up and the happier you're going to be too. I mean, nobody likes being a jerk. And, you know, I would challenge you, even if you've been a jerk your whole life, okay, well, fine. Tomorrow's the first day of the rest of your life. Um, try being nice for a while and, and, and you'll be much happier. And I will tell you, my baseline uh, disposition is not sunny. You know, I don't think I'm a baseline jerk, but I have to work at you know, talking to my staff, engaging people, and uh, it really pays off. I mean, I'm happier at work. Our, our, we have a, a very positive work climate, and um, I think it also gives, uh, gives better patient care. I've got some stuff about opioids uh, which I'm going to skip because I, I did the opioid lecture to this to the same group. I'm going to jump right into kind of my closing happy docs. Um, oh, yeah. First of all, I'll say getting getting suits is miserable. We usually win. We win like 92 percent of our cases to go to trial. It's still I've been sued. I can assure you it's absolutely miserable. So the reason why we have this lecture is these are things which very commonly, at least half our lawsuits occur in those areas that I already described. We might win. You don't want to go through two years, five years of of the lawsuit. It is absolutely all-consuming and awful. So that's why we want to keep you out of lawsuits and 
keep you happy in the practice of medicine. So I'm going to end it there and, and see if anybody has any questions. And uh, while, while we're waiting, if, if um, one doesn't come in, I'll just tell you back to the proceduralists. I was, you know, a little more cognitive field uh, focused in this discussion, but the procedures, you know, again, the informed consent is, is so key. And also the, the checkout, um, I'm sorry, the, uh, the checklist, um, we've had a couple of incidents called in, which I can't really go into, but let's, let's just say, um, a, a doing a checklist goes a long, long way uh, to reduce to reducing the likelihood of, of complications. And so that kind of falls into the why do you do these procedures and protocols if if you know 10 times out of 10 you've done checklists or double check the patient's name with the wristband and so on. Uh, you know didn't didn't label the saline flushes and nothing ever happened and um, you know until someone was got called to a cardiac arrest and put down the appearing to be saline flush and was actually actually vectoronium, real case, um, or the checklist wasn't done or the patient verification wasn't uh, redone before they got anesthetized and, you know, what do you know, wrong patient, uh, real case. It, these things are so important for people who do procedures to not get complacent, you know, failing to have had uh, an adverse outcome uh, doesn't mean skipping those things should continue. Just like my 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 friend in the urgent care who didn't want to check vital signs on uh, on acute visits unless they look really sick because they've never missed anything yet. Well, okay, um, not not best practices. So anyway, those those are very important for reducing your reducing your risk. Hey, we have a few questions now. First question is, do you think that doctors need more time for patient visits to avoid mistakes? Yes, uh, good luck. Um, but yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's maddening how our visits have changed over time. And I would argue that, you know, I came into practice in at least probably about the first 10 years, maybe first 12 years was on paper. And, uh, you know, cause and effect, I will argue yes. I had more time with patients. I had 45 minutes to an hour lunch breaks. I would meet with my professional colleagues over lunch. We would talk about cases. We would have formal presentations. We would socialize. We would get out of the office at 5.30 or 6, and we would go home. And guess what we wouldn't do when we got home? We wouldn't log into our EMRs and go and, you know. So uh, it's a different world with the electronic health record. We have clearly more time spent uh, away from direct patient care uh, and more time spent uh, clicking and staring at a computer rather than with our patients. Uh, I can't tell you what the scientific data shows as far as does this result in more errors? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if that study is, if there's a well-powered study to prove that, but uh, it certainly is a lot different. So if anybody on the screen, you know, I started practice, I finished med school in 93, finished residency in 96. So anybody who's you know, in that generation, uh, I will tell you that it, it's, it's different than it used to be, and it is less time with patients. Okay. Speaking of uh, electronic medical records, with the immediate release of pathology reports to EMR portals, do you have any comments on how that might put physicians at risk, as in if a patient sees a cancer diagnosis before the ordering provider? Yeah, no, good, good question. And, and it probably will actually reduce risk. Um, it, it may make for some frustrating conversations. It may make for some angry patients. Like, why didn't the doctor tell me right away? Why did they make me wait a week? Well, that's not negligent care. I mean, you, you're, you're, you have to practice in the real world. Um, but we think it will probably reduce lawsuits because the overwhelming majority of, of lawsuits that we see around imaging and other studies are failure of communication of the abnormal, unanticipated finding to the patient. So uh, findings that 10 times out of 10, you would know exactly what to do with, but you didn't see them. 
And so patients will be an additional backstop. Now, I'm not going to pretend for a second that it's not going to perhaps increase your workload with more calls. I mean, who here is looking forward to the call about, you know, it says right here, my MCHC was uh, two points outside the normal range. You didn't even tell me about that. You know, what's wrong with you? Well, it's because it doesn't matter. Um, but those kind of conversations, uh, those may increase. The, the systems that have had open records for a while, uh, they report that there has not been uh, a substantial increase in time taken away from uh, what the doctors do and, and that they, on balance, find it is actually freeing of time. Uh, I, I'll believe it when I see it, but no, I don't think it will increase lawsuits. But it, yes, it will change the environment and the climate uh, somewhat. Okay, got a few questions on the same topic. Today, doctors have little assessment time and too much distractions, such as phone calls from nurses while busy with another patient. Can the doctors fight for more assessment time and also fight for decreasing distraction during patient assessment? Well, of course, and uh, you know, I'm a huge advocate for that. Where does this go? I, I suspect, I mean, the pendulum, it's, it, it can't swing much further to the negative. And, and again, I hold myself out there as someone who still likes medicine and would do it again. Uh, but yeah, again, I'm not a fool. Uh, it can't swing much further to the negative as far as how little time we have, how many distractions, interferences we have. I suspect that the, uh, you know, I don't even know what the right term is, but the amount of delegation of basics. So I think office visits very well may start in the future with a, a, a care coordination team that does 10 to 15 minutes of triage, auto-populating, take care of getting all the information accurate in the chart, uh, making sure all your macro and NIPs and CPC and CPC plus and so on information is dialed in. And then basically you're seeing the patient with what we used to get back in the nineties and the early two thousands, which is a problem list of the stuff you cared about and none of the other stuff you didn't care about, as opposed to a 27 page Epic note where you're like, I don't, I don't know what to do with 27 pages of information. Um, so I, I suspect we'll, we'll, someone will get us there. Uh, it's not going to be tomorrow, and uh, you know I don't I don't know if my uh, sympathy and and being a fellow traveler in that space is comforting or not. But I guess maybe knowing you're not the only one who feels that way could be some. And you're not crazy for thinking that. It is it is real. Uh, this is not paranoia. This this is they really are out to get you right now. That is all the questions we have at this point. All right. Well, thank you for having me. I uh, appreciate it. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I like, you know, from working at Copic is that the company really tries hard. And I'm I would, since I was last year, I, well, maybe it had already happened. I don't know. But I was n named director of our medical education and work with, you know, people at all stages of training, med school, you know, residency and, and all the way up to you know, late uh, advanced in practice years. Um, and the idea is in all these scenarios, there are certain things which do an increase the likelihood of lawsuits, which uh, again, lawsuits are miserable. They're two to five years. They're all consuming. I mean, there is, uh, you know, on the pain scale rated up there with, with divorce uh, or financial distress. It, it is all consuming. Again, I can tell you I've been there. It's all consuming. Um, you know, we try very hard, uh, and the company's mission is to try very hard to keep you out of out of lawsuits and make it so you can focus more on medicine. And you know, a couple of you have brought up, yeah, there are some very important distractions which make it harder to do this. And and you know, I acknowledge and accept that. But you know, within the world you have to practice in uh, doing some of these things I mentioned uh, can reduce the likelihood of getting you into this uh, very unpleasant space of a lawsuit. Well, thank you for your presentation. All right, everybody have a good rest of your day.